Praise the Lord together. Just a story. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe he's coming back again. I believe that his spirit's with us. I believe that he gives us power. I believe that he is the Son of God. I believe it. I believe deny it if I said I got here on my own I'd be lying cause my eyes have seen the goodness of the Father with the ones he loves with the ones that he so loves and I can't deny it no I believe in the life of Jesus I believe Sing with us. I believe it. I believe it. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. And we cry, holy, holy, let the earth rejoice. He is worthy of all. Well, good morning. They surprised me with just one song. I wasn't ready to come up, was I? But now we're here, and it's good to be here, and it's good to be back from vacation, and uh, praise God for coming home. Amen. We're glad you came to worship with us today. It's good to have all of you here on this July Sunday, and uh, uh, just uh, good to have you here. I will remind you that we're not eating today, okay? If you've been back in the kitchen, the cabinets have been torn out, and so there's no water back there, all right? Uh, but as soon as that's all fixed, we'll let you know, and we'll get back to eating again. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All righty. I uh, want to remind you about uh, Wednesday, July the 26th, for ages 8 to youth. Donna's going to be taking you on a trip to a water park, park day there, and uh, I don't have the other details. So, if, Donna, did you have anything else you want to say about that?
And you might want the adults to wear those T-shirts, too, in case they get lost. <laughs> All right, I want to remind you that Tim is going to be coming in August, August 18th through the 20th. We'll be telling you more about that very soon. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, we do need to continue to pray for Ed. Uh, he's doing better. Uh, he is still in the hospital. And they're still working with his white blood cell count and some other things, so let, let's continue to pray for him. It's good to have John back with us this morning uh, after surgery. And I understand we may need to be praying for Phil this morning. He's going to be preaching today, but he's got shoulder surgery coming up Friday. We can say, oh, me. <laughs> But please uh, keep Phil in your prayers this morning, if you would. Does anybody got anything you want to share this morning, a testimony of any kind? Yes, ma'am, Sandra. Let's, let's get you a microphone, Sandra, so they can hear you real quickly, okay? It's, it's not a testimony, but um, before you get you all that I wanted to ask you if y'all can keep my mom in your prayers they uh, airlifted her um, two days ago to Savannah to Memorial they thought she had blood on her brain okay. and she keeps falling and I'm not able to drive so I can't just go back into all the time we have a lot going on here too and uh, it's hard for Mark to sit in the car and mm -hmm. th have the two-and-a-half-hour drive back and forth. And, and so we can't do that on a daily basis or anything. And the, um, I told Mama that I'd come up there and stay with her, but she's planning on leaving her home and going into a nursing home. She won't come to stay here when she does come out of the hospital. But they've done all kinds of tests. They did rule out blood on her brain. Her head is real bad swollen. But they found out she has shingles of her eyes. Mm. And it has literally covered her face. And it goes from up in the hairline down into her eyes and across her nose and down around her mouth and her chin. And she can't see out of her left eye. She... Um, actually does have vision in her right eye and um, she thought maybe some of it was happening because of the brain surgeries that she had back in 2004 to, th to 2007 but um, and, and then she thought it was from the falls but they found her on the floor at the house. I'd been calling her for two days trying to get her and couldn't reach her, couldn't reach my aunt to go see about her or find out if she's been talking to her. But anyway, um, she actually was talking to me last night. We talked for a long time on the phone and she sounded good. But she told me, she said, I can't stay by myself no more. And uh, she's wanting to go into a nursing home. And I told her, I'll come stay with you every other week. So if I can't get her here, that means I'm going to go up there if I can convince her but she thinks that she's burdening everybody if she goes to her house but she's taking care of us all these years and it's our turn to take care of her we helped her with my papa till he passed out and I told passed away and I told her that we would come there and start swapping and staying but um she says, no, she, she thinks that she'd be better off going into a nursing facility. So um, I just wanted y'all to remember her in prayers. And one other thing is my son on Friday, a uh, um, dump truck pulled out in front of his work truck, and he had a bad accident, and they had him in the ER. So y'all please, he's at home, but y'all please keep him in your prayers too. Well, Sandra, if you'll come down here, we're going to pray for your mother right now for sure and your son. Um, remember Jane also. Uh, Sandra mentioned shingles with her mother. Jane has shingles also. Let's continue to pray for her. All right, if you will, come with us and pray together.
Father, we thank you first of all for being our mighty God, for loving us, for caring for us, and we thank you for Mark and Sandra and uh, their being here with us and for what they mean to all of us. And I pray right now for Sandra's mother, Lord, that you would reach down and touch her, God. There's a lot going on, it sounds like. But God, you know every part of it. You know what needs to be done. And Lord, we're just going to entrust her to your care. Lord, we pray for healing in her body, Lord, and for uh, healing in her mind, whatever else need, you need to touch, Lord. I, I just pray that you would do that now. Lift this burden from Sandra, Lord. And God, just take care of her this morning. Pray for a son, Lord, that you would be with him, Lord, and, and continue healing him after this wreck. I pray for Phil now, Lord, that you would be with him Friday, Lord, as the surgery takes place, Lord. Uh, we just pray, God, that there would be quick healing there, Lord, and he'll get use of his arm back real quickly, Lord. Uh, I thank you for what you've done for John, for what you're doing for Mr. Ed and uh, for others, Lord, for Jane. I pray that you continue healing for her with the shingles. And, God, there's just a lot of that need help right now, God. And, Lord, we're turning to you because you're the one who can do something about it. Yes. And, go, we we'll just love you and we're trusting you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Chair, I have two uh, praise reports, if we just got a second. Um, I just want to, uh, like, I want to thank everybody who's been praying for mom and dad and the family. I want to tell you that prayer works because I came in here Wednesday and I gave everybody an update on dad and it wasn't looking too good. His white counts were going up, which means his infection was just, um, I don't want to say ravaging his body, but it was definitely getting worse. And uh, Bo was the first one to speak up. He said, sit right there in that chair. We're going to pray for you. And I can tell you that since uh, Thursday, Friday, and then coming to today, the that his white count has been going down about, I don't know exactly how it works, but about 10 every single day. We were about 55, and as of yesterday, he's like 14 or 15, and he's actually, um, um, I guess, like more lucid. Like he, I think it was the pain medicine, but he'd just been kind of talking, you know, kind of out of it, you know, just kind of making silly comments about things, not the normal silly comments, but it's just been a lot more... Uh, lucid and you know talking to uh, not like looking through us but talking to us so I want to thank you for your prayers and I just want to tell you that they work they've been working um, and please continue to pray uh, for dad and mom and then part two um, I don't think Miss Nidra is in here and she didn't ask me to but on behalf of her and her family I just want to say that, uh, you know, thank you to everybody who showed up yesterday. You know, God provided every single resource that was needed, every single person that was needed from the labor to trying to get this thing figured out. Um, we, a uh, young gentleman, looked at the boxes and looked at the stuff and looked at that truck and said, we're going to need another truck. <laughs> and believe it or not, we filled both of those trucks top to bottom from front to back. And uh, it got done. Uh, 8.30 to 5.30 yesterday, but God provided everything that needed to happen, um, it happened. And so just for, uh, for her, uh, you know, just thank you, and it's, it was just a great day yesterday, just kind of fellowship and then getting this thing done. All right, thank you, Jason. I understand a vast majority of those boxes were frogs. <laughs> if anybody knows Nidra, you know what we're talking about. Yes, Bo? <coughs> DC made me promise that I would announce it that, uh, for the back to school bash that we had at school yesterday. There was a lot of donations taken up from here in the church body, and we carried a bunch of supplies to the school there. And we just want to thank everybody for what they donated and the, the effort we put in there to uh, reach out to the community. That's what we're supposed to be about. So we just make sure we thank everybody who, who gave anything or, or brought anything. And we just thank you for Jeff and myself and, and uh, Dee Dee and Miss Elaine going take, taking time to go up there and spend it out. And we got an awesome opportunity to share with a bunch of young people while we were there. So it was a good day. Thank you, Yes, sir. <laughs> Yesterday at the American Legion building here in Irwinton, uh, we had a food trucks and some uh, horse rides and different things and it was to uh, 
make money to give to the kids for their supplies at the school. So we raised enough money yesterday to uh, give stuff to about 100 kids. Good, good. Amen. Donna's here with us again this morning, and I believe she wanted to share something with you this morning. So, Donna, you come on. I promised y'all she was going to do this, so here she is. <laughs> and look how straight she's standing. Isn't that neat, what God's done? Amen. God is good, and this church family has been amazing. Uh, they uh, brought food, flowers, cards, gifts, did odd jobs at the house, just... But most especially the prayers that have been sent up on my behalf. God has, God has heard those prayers and He's answered those prayers, and I'm, I'm living proof right here. And just want to give Him all the praise, the honor, and the glory for what He has done. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to ask you to stand at this time, if you would. This will be a time of giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Blessing bowl is in the middle aisle, right up front here, so you come and give now, as Keith plays. if I could have your attention, please, for just a moment. Uh, I wanted to mention this. Stevie just asked that we pray for his dad, Joey, so I want to mention that to you so this week you can be praying for him. That God will really get a hold of him, okay? And God will change his heart, so let's, let's do pray for him. I uh, got a note here from uh, Claire Gall, or Deborah Gall, excuse me, I'm sorry, that yeah, they've been coming here. Uh, recently, and she just recently lost her husband, and she made this to Winnie and the ladies of VOT because Winnie kind of headed this up. She said, words can't express the love and kindness God's love in each of you shown to us during this time. Thank you for the meals, those days, and prayers for us. We felt and continue to feel them now. We are taking one day at a time, having peace, knowing he is with Jesus, and no pain, no walker, no wheelchair, no cane, praise the Lord. You are all a blessing to us, VOT has been during the past months that we have been visiting. So thank all of you for your kindness to them, and she wanted to thank you also. All right, we're going to sing it this time now, and I want to lead us in a prayer here. Once again, I, we say this uh, on occasion, that we want you just to really get your hearts in tune with God now. My prayer always is before we come here, that the Holy Spirit move in this place and that the Holy Spirit move in everybody's heart and mind. But if you don't open your heart and mind to him, you may not feel that movement. You may not sense that movement this morning. So your part now is to get focused and to focus on Jesus and let him do his work in your life this morning. God, we love you again and we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the praise band, God, and the music they provide. And I just pray that you would bless them now as they lead us in singing. Lord, may we just lift our hearts to you now and our voices, Lord, as we praise you and, and lift your name up. God, we do pray for Phil as he brings a sermon this morning, Lord, that it'll be a clear message, God, that all of us get. 
God, that we understand what you're trying to teach us and trying to show us, Lord, and that we get it. And God, that it changes our living. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a
of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Amen. And all my life you have been so, so goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I'm gonna see of the goodness of God. Here we go. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running it's running after me. And all my life he has been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see. Of the goodness of God. Your, Your goodness, goodness is running, running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running, it keeps on running after. the goodness of God. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna sing of the goodness of God. Amen. i 
loving my Jesus, showing my scars, telling my story, how mercy can reach you where you are. I pray the whole world hears the cry of my heart. To see all the morning.
You know, every day is a great day. But you don't really know how great it is till you know the Lord. A uh, lady came last week and visited. She asked for prayer today. A uh, little girl, uh, Miss Kara Bluff, that came last week. And uh, she asked for this little girl prayer for her. The girl is three years old. She lives in Wisconsin. She's having brain surgery today. She has a blood clot on her brain. So she came one time, and she thought enough of us to ask us to pray for her. Oh, a couple of times. Okay. Okay. Okay, she just told me about this. I didn't know it was a grandson. So I'm just saying, when you connect with the Lord and people see it, feel it, they feel an important thing. So we're going to, we'll pray. When I get through preaching, we're going to pray anyway. We're going to pray for her. But I want you to think about the people we brought up already today. Terry mentioned different ones and all. Just think about them during the day and ask God, what do you need to ask him to help them? But see, he's about helping. He's about answering prayers. That's what's so awesome about God. He, he wants to do good for his children. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you really know that. But I, the sermon I got today, today is a pretty tough sermon. I'm going to tell you all, it's been wearing me out. And sometimes, though, I preach once a month, and I'm going to tell you, when you work on one for a month, Terry can probably tell you, you don't get as much time as I do, but you'll think about what you're saying, you know, try to keep playing it over and see if you're doing it the best way. You know, you just, you just work on it, you know, because the last thing you want to do is say something that's not correct. I, I love Jeff Dixon. I'll tell you all, because sometimes he'll question me about some things. And once or twice he's had to show me where it was what I said, and I've come up here and said something about it. But sometimes he goes and searches and finds out what I said was right, you know. So iron sharpens iron, and it's great to have people that really listen enough to challenge you. You know what I'm talking about? It ain't, it ain't, it's great. It's bad when you're not challenged. It's bad when you don't. And today, what I'm going to talk about today, I know people look at things different. I know they believe different. But I'm going to support what I'm saying with Scripture. We can take scripture sometime and make it mean something maybe to different people. Does that make sense? But there's a reason there's so many different nominations. Y'all do understand that. It's because where you brought up, you get caught up in something sometimes that you feel like it's got to be this way. Okay? The word is one way, and the word's true. But you get caught up sometimes wanting to prove your point instead of seeking and looking to find out if you're right. That's reading the Bible so hard sometimes to understand because you're not where you need to be yet to understand it. I think God made a mistake. Is God's trying to get you in it deeper so he can show you something deeper. And I'm telling you right now, there's some things in here that I'm going to say about David, and I can't show it to you in Scripture. I'm going to give you my reason if I understand it that way. Does that make sense? Pray. Lord, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful church family, Lord. I thank you for being so alive and active in so many people. And I pray as we uh, go through this today, Lord, I look forward to how you, how you show us things, reveal things. And I know some of these verses, I'm even going to talk about my dad struggled with them. And I've struggled with them. But Lord, we, we thank you for opening up doors and, Lord, showing us things. And I pray as we read this today and go through it, I pray that, we just only get what you want us to get. I pray for your words. Not, nobody else is not mine. Anybody else is yours. And I thank you for your word because it's always true. I look forward to this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you know, um, God's way is faith, always perfect. Y'all understand that? It ain't close to perfect. It ain't partial. It's perfect. His way is perfect. You know, he picked Mary to have his Jesus, his son. Okay? And... It, it don't say Mary had the Holy Spirit in it. It said Mary was righteous. Okay? And it said that he came to her, an angel came to her, and told her she was going to have a son, a child. And she said, name him Jesus. But we know that you can't have a child out of wedlock in a, 
any time that's right by God, especially in the Old Testament, they would kill you. So she had to take a man who we don't say had the Holy Spirit in him, just said he was a man of God. Joseph, she was supposed to be married to him, and the angel came to her and told her what was going to happen. He said, you will have a child. You're going to have a child. So she said she pondered that. She wondered about it. How can this be when I, I've, I've never, I'm a virgin? Good question, right? He said, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And you'll be, have a child by the Holy Spirit. And how could she explain that to Joseph? We can sit and talk all we want. It ain't possible, is it? But God can do it through a, oh, this thing keeps falling down today. But God can do it, okay? So we had to send an angel to Joseph to tell Joseph what happened. You with me? Because there's no only way he could do it. So when scripture comes into effect, I start thinking about it. He couldn't do it no other way. It wasn't possible. It was only possible through the way he did it. Because we all got to have the same opportunity. So in scripture, I struggle with why the brothers didn't believe. How could you live in a family with a kid growing up right beside you all your life and not understand or not hear? So God could not have let her tell, tell those kids at all, not no time, who he was. Can you imagine Canaan trying to cleave or Kyle one trying to tell somebody Canaan was the Messiah? It ain't about how he acts. It's about how their life would be if they knew it. What would it do to their life? What would it do to the three brothers if they truly believed Mama? They'd have to tell them. Then you've got a story going on. It wouldn't be nothing like the Bible is. It would change everything, wouldn't it? So there's no way she could tell them. He had to live such a life that he lived such a life. Don't you all know what kind of life Jesus lived? At 12 years old, he was in a synagogue, right? Teaching the p teachers. They couldn't believe what he was saying. So somebody, they had to know something was different because they went back to find him. There he was teaching, right? So as you see these things happening, it still don't mean he's a Messiah. He could be a prophet. He could be a real smart kid. But how did he get this learning? Only by God. So when you're reading Scripture sometimes, it says some hard things in it. It tells you some hard things. And we're thinking maybe what, maybe it don't mean exactly that. Anybody ever done that? Maybe that's for somebody else. You read long enough, you're going to find out who it's for. And it ain't nobody else. It's that Mary you're looking at. But as I, I went through that, it just kept wearing me out. Okay, you can. Okay. Because it was like, I thought it was in my ear. Let's look in Scripture. I want you to follow me in some Scripture. Look at Mark chapter 3. Twenty to twenty-one. We're going to be mainly in the New Testament today. Mark three twenty to twenty-one. It said then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. So a lot of people thought he was special, didn't they? When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. See, they knew he was Jesus. Think about that now. They lived with him. They watched him. They watched him grow up to 30 years old. He's out of his mind. You think he acted like did he growing up? You think they acted like he did? You think he was the same? There was something different about him, correct? They probably maybe felt jealous, like Joseph, like this brothers of him, because he was able to tell people, everybody looked to him, everybody followed him, everybody listened to him. When he went with 12 years old, it had to be a reason, because God wanted him there. He, his, his whole life was lived by God, because he was God. But he couldn't use that in the human flesh. He lived a life like us. But 
perfect. God's eyes, he offers salvation to all through faith in Jesus. No other way. Those kids would not have been able to have that same understanding if their mama knew and their mama told them. They had to either think their mama was a liar or wasn't true. They would have been, had to struggle with all kinds of stuff. They had to come just like we did, through faith in him, seeing him as Jesus, knowing he was Jesus, not till Jesus told them he was Jesus. You understand? No exception, no advantage. You can't have an advantage in God's eyes. It's all equal with God. You can't blame where you grow up. You can't blame where you live. You can't blame your mom and daddy. The Bible says man is without excuse. Zero. I made it so everyone can know. I don't care if you're predestined or not predestined. You've got an opportunity to know. Through creation itself, the Bible says you should know. Some people come through God, to God through circumstances. Some good, some bad. Correct? You can't, you can't put a pinpoint on probably how you came. You can say the time it happened, what happened, what you felt that night, but it came through a journey of things you did, choices you made, places you were. Everything you've done adds up. How long it took is because of you. When you came is because of you. I don't think God had me do all the things I did wrong to get me to a point. I made a choice to get to that point. But I blame a lot of people. I hear blames every day. I hear excuses every day of my life. Something to do with this. If you're talking about the Bible, you'll hear an excuse. Keep it to yourself. You won't hear nothing. You won't hear nothing. They won't nobody know no different. He offers it to anyone who seeks him. Seeking you will find. Knocking the door will be open, right? From anybody whose heart is repented. Who repents from their sin and realizes they're separated from God. When you realize you wasn't who you thought you was, or you was who you thought you was, you wanted something different. And you hoped it was real. You hoped Jesus was real. You hoped the story was true. Not until you repented to find out it was true. The playing field in God's way, always perfect. Always perfect. Nothing changes. There ain't but one thing in this world that will never, never, never change right here. Will never change. No matter how you want to look at it, read it, accept it, it's the same no matter what. Old, te Old Testament believer believed in men God used to reveal himself to them, correct? Believed in man. New Testament believers in a man that God sent named Jesus, correct? Which saved past, present, future. When he says creation itself, sort of nullifies anybody saying, well, where I brought up or what I did or where I come. When he says that, he's saying, if you just see what you see, you can find me. You just open your eyes and watch the lightning. Watch a hummingbird. Watch a sparrow. Watch any animal you can see God. But you'll never see him when you don't know him or look for him. I never paid any attention to any of that the way I pay attention to it today. But some teachings, hard teaching in this Bible. We're going to look at the rich rule in Mark 10, 17 to 31, but I'm just going to try to hit a little bit before I get there. I'm going to tell you, in the first few verses, 17, it talks about Looking for eternal life, the rich man asked Jesus, how do you have eternal life? Called him good. He said, no one's good but God, Jesus said. You know the commandments? He named, all, he named all six commandments. And he said, all these I've kept. 
Jesus said, Jesus loved you. Correct? He loved him so much he told him the truth. Go sell everything you got. But this happens to be the only man the Bible ever told that to. Y'all believe that? Or you believe it's equal with everybody? Do you sit here as a believer in Christ and own anything? Do you sit here as a believer in Christ and own anything? Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to give it all away, right? But he loved the guy. The reason he said he loved him because he knew he loved his material more. He preferred him to tell him the truth. See what I'm saying? Because it says he loved him, then he told him. When you love somebody, you'll tell them the whole truth. Not just something to get them going. Verse 27, or let's go to 23. He said, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for rich, rich to enter the kingdom of God? I've heard tons of stories on this next one. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus again said, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? Who did he say to it? Children. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now listen to me. He didn't say disciples or men. He said children. Listen to this. You know what? Because children knew what a camel looked like. Children knew how big the eye of a needle was. See the example he used. In other words, the next verse says the truth. He says, it is easy, okay. Disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Do you understand what he's saying? If you ain't got God in this situation, man cannot do it. But if you move man out and look at something you don't really know, and trust in the one you're hearing about, that he can show you how you can get that camel through that eye. Because it is impossible with man. All things are possible with God. Only things of man are possible without God. You can't, if you ain't got God in it, it's only possible if man can do it. But with God, you can do anything. I know I ain't going to read the scripture, but he said, if you want this mountain to move, say move, and it'll move over here, correct? That sounds like a lie, don't it? Would, he, would God do more for Elijah than he would you? Would he do more for this? He saw a cloud this big, and it rained for three and a half years. He fed him with a bird, a crow. He did so many things in the Bible that we read and see how he treated the people that listened to him and obeyed him, and we struggle. Verse 26, so then he said, then Peter spoke, Spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. We've left it all. We've left it all. Truth. Correct? Listen now. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brother or sister or mother or father or children or field for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Listen now. Did y'all hear what I read? Why would you repeat this? Home, then he said the same thing again, but he said homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and field, along with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. What age to come? This is New Testament. Why would he not say persecution and eternal life in the first conversation? Because you can follow him and do all these things and get a hundred times as much. But if you ain't willing to get persecuted, you ain't willing to speak up for it, there's something going on here in this verse when he tells you, when he reads it, the same thing and stops, and then he says, eternal life, or persecution and eternal life. Then he, he, said, he says, uh, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Who in here likes to be last? I used to couldn't stand it. I love being last. I know this verse. I tell you right now, me and Jeff are arguing who's going to be last. 
Oh, I mean, there's certain ones that get in the back of the line. Here, we're getting, and we want to be last. We won't feel like we ain't trying to get ahead of nobody. But we got some going to knock the door down to get first. Because either they don't understand this verse or they got another reason. I don't know. But you've got to put everybody ahead of you. That's what it says. Put others first. Turn to, turn to Matthew 5.10. I hope y'all love me when I get through. 510. This is the Beatitudes. 510 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Persecution again, ain't it? Look at uh, John 15, 20. John 15, 20, 22. Remember what, I, what, remember what I told you. A servant is not grace, greater than a master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoke to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. How clear is that? It was so much clearer the last few times I read it as I've been in my life. Second Timothy 3. Way up to 17. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God's breath. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's talking to every one of them. He didn't write this just for Timothy. He did, well, every servant of God knows how to act. Knows that you're supposed to be persecuted. Notice they're going to talk about you. When you go out in the world and you see 100 people, how many of them you think really know the Lord? Three or four or five, maybe? Ten? On a good day? Unless you're hanging out in church, okay? In the real world. Who's supposed to tell them? And you'll get persecuted. Matthew 10, 32. Matthew 10, 32 to 39. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be their member of their own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Does that sound like something that we think? Does that even sound, my daddy... I'm telling you, we talked about any verses. This one and another one I'm going to read. He's, he had a hard time with it. I had a hard time with it. But like a light bulb come on the other day. 
Look at 9, Luke 9, 57 to 62. Nine fifty-seven. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. He replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place for his head. We've asked this question, why would he have a place for his head? He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go proclaim the kingdom of God. Then another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. He replied, no one who puts a, ply, puts a hand to the ply and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. That sound like easy teaching? It sounds terrible, don't it? And we're talking about God, Jesus don't call nobody out. I'm going to read two more for I'm going to tell you something. You know, it sounds like God's jealous, don't it? You know why? Because he is jealous. He's a jealous God. And he won't share you with nobody. You understand that? Nobody. Can't put my grandchild, my wife, and nobody out of God. You better hear what I'm saying now. But I'm telling you, I'll be there one day. Jesus couldn't trust nobody. Couldn't lay his head nowhere down. He said in John chapter two, last verse, something says he did not trust no man because he knew what was in man. Matthew 12, 46 to 50. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. Do you understand what he's saying? He's not comparing anybody else to him. If you're not of God, you're not in the right family. I don't care who your family is. If you're not in God, you're the only one in your family of God, then you better be telling them about God because they're in the wrong family. We put everything we want ahead of ourselves. We can look at any way we want to look at Scripture. But there's no way for Jesus to say that when he knew who his mother was. He knew she was a holy woman. He knew all that. But he said, my mother and my brother and my sister want to hear God's word and what? Obey it. Obey it. You know, this reveals to us that anyone that is still in the family that were born in, that were born in, and not in the family of God, is still dead. Let the dead bury the dead. And then what he calls people that's unsaved? Dead. He, you couldn't say this if that wasn't the way. That's why you must have them hate them only if they aren't believers. Jesus refers to these families as dead. Let the dead bury the dead. Hate your father and mother and brother and sister. People that are not born again. He don't mean physically hate them. He means hate the sin that's still in them. Hate the because they can't understand what you're saying without the Holy Spirit telling them. You understand that you can talk to them till you blue in the face, but they cannot understand you till they got the Spirit of God to reveal it to them. Family that are born in the Spirit of God is the only family Jesus is in. God, your Father. Jesus, your brother? That's the question you got to answer. He is, I'm living like him. When I stumble and fall, he helps me up. When I sin, I know it and tell him I sin. And I might have to do it every day and sometimes ten times a day. But I'm not going to go to bed at night without thinking about what I did that day. I lost my Bible this morning. I'm going to tell you how bad I'm getting. I couldn't find my Bible this morning when I went to go in there to get ready and it wasn't on my table. 
The only place I take my Bible is my truck and my table. That's the only place I take my Bible. The Bible studies or something. And, I, and it's early this morning. My wife's in Florida. I want to blame her, but she wasn't there. So I got outside. I went back through my truck again. I walked around the pasture side because I pulled up like this. come out this door. Went through the, and looked in both sides. Looked under the seat. Looked in the back seat. Went back in the house. I thought, well, maybe yesterday morning I was in a hurry and put it in the wrong truck. So I went out of my other truck. Went through my other truck. Couldn't find it. Went back in the house, started looking through all the cabinets in case she picked it off the table. But I knew I took it with me, so I got to thinking of every step I went yesterday, where I could have laid it. Where I, but I didn't take it out of my truck. I went back to the truck again for the third time. I mean, then I moved everything. I took a jacket out. I mean, I got it down to just about, well, not bare metal, because my truck ain't never going to be bare metal. I got a lot moved. Couldn't find it. Went back and sat there, and I just sat there. It was killing me. I couldn't even, hardly, I couldn't even study, because I, I had other Bibles, but I wanted my Bible. I said, let me go look one more time. So I, went back out and I walked around the front of the truck this time, and it's laying on the hood where I got out last night and laid it up by, on the hood when I walked in the dog house. Right there on the hood in front of God and everybody, but I was so eager and so hard looking where I thought that I couldn't even see it. Now, you know how I felt then, don't you? Y'all been there? I was so glad my wife went home where she could tell me about how crazy that was. It was unbelievable. The word is everything. Mark 8, 34 to 38. Then he called a crowd to, cry out to him, him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel, he threw the gospel in again now, because that is him, right? We'll save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, in what? This adulterous and sinful generation. Look at the TV. Go out there and pay attention and listen to what people are saying. It's pitiful. The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. John 14. We'll read through this quick. I've got three more short verses. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Do you see him? Do you not see him in people? Do you not see him? Just like the wind, don't you see the effect of him, what he's doing? Because I live, you also will live. He's not talking about death now. He's talking about life. He's giving you life. On that day, you will re realize that I am in the Father, and that you are in me, and I am in you. That one? Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will, too will love them and show myself to them. Has he shown himself to you? Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? He replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. What's that word? Anyone. My Father will love them, and we will come to make them and make our home with them. If anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Do you see where you get your memory from and when he comes back? Any of y'all like, like me where something goes through your mind, you pick the phone up and call, and by the time they answer or don't answer, you forgot what you're going to tell them? 
I hate to tell y'all all this stuff, but that happens. Look at you say, anybody, you feel so bad because I, I call you right back, you know. Lord, what was I thinking? And then all of a sudden, it's like it's, like it's a rolling wheel. All of a sudden, it rolls back through, and right there it is, and you can pick it up and call. It's crazy. I hope I ain't the only one that does all this stuff. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going away, going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father Hear what he said. Jesus said, I love the Father. I do everything he said. Those who love me will obey me. So I want to be able to say, I love Jesus, so I'll obey him. John 15, 17. Excuse me, John, I'm sorry, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. First John. Let's go back and say one now. I don't know why I wrote down two, but I know. It is two. I'm sorry. Fifteen. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. You got to spend time with him to know his will. Verse 28 and 29, same chapter. God's, God's children in sin. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know he, that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has seen, has been born of God. Last verse, chapter 3, 7 to 10. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is simple is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Sure, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. You know, this sort of seems like it's really hard and pointing out a bunch and saying things that's a little bit tough. It's saying a lot is tough. The problem is today, even when it's just a little sin or whatever, we want to justify it. We want to make ourselves feel okay. That's all sin. When God shows you something in your life, in your life, not somebody else, in your life that you need to work on or change or talk to him about, that's what you need to do. That's the reason it comes to you, so he can change you and bring you closer. Where, you, where Satan can't keep attacking, Satan can't get in. You're trying to tear out the doors that Satan's using. If you're holding on to something because it's a habit and you've been doing it and you think it's okay to do it, that will never change until you surrender it and die to self and give it to him. Even if you love the Lord and follow him, you cannot continue doing these things because the Spirit's going to stay to eat at you. God don't have no child, nobody he don't speak to and work in. He's alive and active all the time. He wants no one to perish, all to have eternal life, right? Think about your children. The number one thing in your life after coming to know God is to make sure your children know the Lord. The 
the world ain't going to tell them. And in my case, it'd be children and grandchildren. I mean, I guarantee you, every person that's got grandchildren, if you ain't thinking about how much you can do to maybe be time with them or talk to them or spend something with them to bring them to know the Lord, if they don't know him, you're not thinking right. Because no one's going to take your place doing that. They could. God could send someone if the child comes around and asks for it. But they look up to you. They see you. They want to spend time with you. Take time in your life to spend time in the right places with the right people. Anyone you run into during the day, if they're not of God, they want an opportunity just to speak to them. Tell them why God's changed your life and how he did. Tell them how much you love them. Keep Knock up on me better. But I mean, God loves us. Period. Right where you are, He loves you. But if you're in sin, you've never given your life to Him. He, has, he hates you because He hates sin. He wants you to come and trust in what He did, not what He's going to do, but what He's already done. He's already made the way. He ain't going to add no more to it or take it away. It's the same way for everybody through faith in what his son did on the cross. Just like Abraham. He trusted Abraham to do what he said he would do. And Abraham even sacrificed his own son. He would. He's wanting you to sacrifice something. He's wanting you to give up. He's wanting you to sacrifice maybe your time, maybe your money, maybe your something, if you're holding on to it. Talk to him. Come up here. He's alive and active as everyone in this church is. I feel the spirit in this church all the time. God ain't hard to find. If you slow down, he'll run you over. He, I mean, he's looking for you. He's craving for you. That's what the Bible says. He desires to have a relationship with you all the time, not just sometimes. If you talk to people, you'll find out this world's hurting. There's people who don't know. There's people in church that don't know and understand. This church is teaching such crazy things today. You will never get to heaven without accepting the blood Jesus shed. Your blood will never get you there. No matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, His blood's on the way. Lord, thank you so much for this day. And I thank you being in a place, Lord, where we can, we can read the whole scripture. We don't have to try to color code it to try to make it feel good. Lord, if it feels good, something's probably wrong with it. Because, Lord, it cuts through. Pray everyone is still to know you. I know that this family is here. I need some help. I know there's something here that needs the children to know. The working people to know. And Lord, you're going to hold us accountable for that. We know you. Don't let us deceive ourselves and think going to church is I wouldn't know you. Give me money in the place, I wouldn't know you. Oh, well, that's anybody can do that. But dying to self, Lord, is what you asked for. No other way. We want to let you know we love you.